Hey Unwrappers, if you enjoy this podcast's approach to the news, then you will love The Week magazine. Curated from a diverse range of independent sources, The Week magazine delivers a refreshingly open-minded view of current affairs. And now, for a limited time, you can enjoy six free issues and then save an extra 10% on a print and digital subscription. Simply enter the offer code SUMMER23 at theweek.co.uk slash offer to claim your free trial today. That's the code SUMMER23 at theweek.co.uk slash offer. It's the week ending Saturday the 24th of June and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen a submersible visiting the Titanic wreckage go missing with five men on board, Andrew Tate charged with human trafficking, rape and forming an organised crime group, and festival goers heading to Glastonbury for Elton John's farewell show. You can read all you need to know about everything that matters in The Week magazine, but we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And joining me today from the week's digital team, we have a newbie, newsletter editor Rebecca Evans, from Auto Trader, its director of YouTube, Rory Reed. And it's been a while, but you know what they say, you Sir Chandra can't keep a good Chakrabarti down. It's comedian and broadcaster, Sir Chandrika <laughs> Chakrabarti. Uh, now, Rebecca, as is customary on this show, whenever someone new joins us, I've, I've made this rod for my back. I'm now going to ask you to share one thing about yourself we wouldn't be able to discover just by Googling you. <laughs> well, you're kind of putting me on the spot here, but uh, I will give it my best shot. I think something potentially ungoogleable about me. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I discovered that I have Swedish and Italian ancestry. How? Courtesy of one of those uh, ancestry websites, you send off your little DNA and uh, end up getting a whole bunch of interesting results. Have you always had a pen charm for meatballs and sausage or not? <laughs> Ikea meatballs, I have I have a tendency to towards liking. So perhaps that's where I get it from. Suddenly it all makes sense. Uh, Rory, you're up first. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Well, this week should be remembered for the positives and negatives of Apple's iPhone battery redesign. Get it? For this repair, you'll need a P2 Pentalobe driver, a Philips double zero driver, a Y triple zero driver, an eye opener, a suction handle or ice clack, I fix it opening picks, tweezers, a spudger, and some isopropyl alcohol. We also recommend using our magnetic mat so you can keep track of screws and write down notes during your repair. How to replace the battery in your iPhone 13, a video from iFixit's YouTube channel. Sounds a breeze, Rory. What's a spudger? But uh, fiddly upgrades like this could soon be a thing of the past. Yeah, absolutely. So the European Parliament, right, voted yes on replacement battery legislation. And that means that everybody, and this affects Apple massively, anyone who makes phones with integrated non-removable batteries has got to redesign their phones. And the deadline is 2027. By then, every single iPhone must have a battery that you can remove and replace. Okay, so this isn't just iPhones, actually, then. So it's every, in fact, it's every electronic device, right? It has to have a replaceable battery by that date. Yeah, so the whole thing is that they want people to have the right to repair their gadgets. What tends to happen is that many manufacturers can make an extra bit of money, shall we say, when uh, a customer's device fails and they have to buy a brand new one. So, you know, obviously not everyone can shell out up to £1,500 or whatever for a new uh, iPhone 14 if it, if it decides to die. So the thought behind the process is that by allowing people to replace the broken components inside these gadgets, they'll be able to prolong the life of the devices and make people's lives easier and also make it a much more sustainable ecosystem for the devices as well. So Chandrika, you were nodding along there. Have you been caught out by devices that were unrepairable? Do you know what? Not so far, but I've just, like next month, I'll have paid off my phone after three years. And 
Then you can upgrade. So it's an iPhone SE 2020, like the most basic iPhone, nothing exciting. And it's been like over £400 and I can upgrade immediately, which feels very wasteful. Like the phone works perfectly. It's fine. I'm happy to stick with it. But I checked like the resale value and it's, you know, I've paid over £400. The resale value is £53. That is ridiculous. Like there's no point in me trying to sell it to someone else and prolonging its life. There's no point or like any reward in me trying to do the sustainable thing. So this feels like really important news that the onus is now on the manufacturers to make these devices, which everybody has in their pockets, much more sustainable. And um, they have a shelf life beyond the three years it takes to pay them off or whatever sort of plan people choose. It's a couple of years usually. And so we should use them beyond that time. Yeah. And Rebecca, this is the second intervention from the European Parliament in just over a year, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it's pretty exciting um, in terms of the developments that are happening. I mean, the new law means that any newly made equipment that can be charged with a wire has to include now a USB-C port instead of the old micro ports or one of Apple's new fangled uh, lightning ports. And that's something that kicks in 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 2024. So Apple and and other providers are already looking at the the changes that they can make in order to make their their products compliant with the law, really. Yeah. So, Rory, we're going to have devices in a few years' time that will all have USB-C and will all have changeable batteries. What do Apple and their like make of that? Well, the reason that they've dragged their feet is that they probably care more about their intellectual property and also profits than people's right to repair their equipment. But there's been loads of lobbying and advocacy and regulatory pressure by people to kind of support the right to repair their, 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 these products. Previously, Apple have said that messing around with phones and allowing people to kind of go elbow deep in a, in a, in a laptop or a, or a mobile phone actually presents a security risk. They reckon hackers can access the chips inside the phone, which could lead to people losing their data potentially. But I mean, believe that if you will. I think the most important thing is that they've actually been forced to do this. And while they have dragged their feet, they're edging ever slowly towards allowing people to make repairs. They've actually started a new self-repair program that gives people access to around 200 parts and tools that allow you to repair things like you know screens and batteries and cameras. But it's really hard to do right now. What they need to do, according to this law, is to make it much easier. The problem is, it won't be easy. It's not like in the old days, in the 90s and 2000s, when you could pop off the back and you know pop in a replacement battery. There's still going to be a lot of hassle required to swap these batteries out because the battery is going to be glued down and you're going to need special tools to unclip the back end. And it's not going to be as you know friendly as you, as you might expect reading this new law. And the reasons for that, Sir Chandrika, aren't just about Apple protecting their intellectual property. They are also, to be fair, about ensuring that the design meets the requirements of their, you know, very wealthy, generally, consumers who have chosen a premium product. I mean, for example, their phones are waterproof, aren't they? Now, I'm sure Apple can rise to the challenge and keep their next generation of phone as waterproof and have a USB-C and a changeable battery, but you see the engineering problem there. The situation as it is at the moment is if people don't like the fact they can't change the battery, they can go and buy another phone, can't they? Why, why should they have to comply? So I think there's, there's a couple of things to look at here. And on the manufacturer side, it's the fact that sustainability is becoming a much bigger issue when it comes to batteries. So if you're looking at the uh, minerals that make up batteries, you're looking at lithium, cobalt, copper, lead and nickel. And those are really difficult to access. You've got to go mining for them. And they really need to be recovered from batteries and recycled now. Otherwise, we're going to start running out of them. They're going to start becoming really expensive. And the prices of our batteries and our phones and our laptops will shoot up. So there's definitely a sustainability issue that the manufacturers would have to deal with anyway. But I will say also, on the other hand, as somebody, I'm I'm not just on this uh, podcast to have a go at at Apple, but I've had my laptop since 2015. I was very lucky that my old um, workplace made me redundant and gave me this as part of the package. (laughs) And I will say... Thanks, guys. But I will say, like, I've been needing to replace this battery for a long time. And the the device itself is kind of falling apart now. And the problem is, like, as a freelancer, I work on this laptop all the time. I take it on holiday. I'm always working. It's a fun life. But you've got to go and give it to an Apple store for three to five days. It costs a couple of hundred pounds and they replace a battery. That's all it needs. It's nothing really bigger than that. And so if you took away that issue, I wouldn't have that kind of problem. And I do think 
these new regulations kind of work for the consumer as well, that we're in a sort of bind where the main issue with my laptop is this battery issue. And without it, it'd just be a completely perfectly fine working device, which has been going for nearly 10 years. So I do think there's an extent to which the shelf life of these products is kept a bit artificially low to keep us buying. Yeah, I mean, Rebecca, part of what the European Parliament have ruled on is also to do with the recyclability of these batteries that are then being discarded, isn't it? Yes. I mean, there's 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 been a study recently uh, by a New York-based team that said there was only a 1% rate in the recycling of lithium-ion batteries. Now, thankfully, because of existing EU regulation, fewer smartphone batteries actually end up in landfill. But the problem happens when recycling rates are so poor. Uh, the sustainability that we're all looking for is not something that we can that, that seems to be ach- achievable right now. Whether that's to do with people's lack of awareness of the ability to recycle batteries or something else entirely. And actually, interestingly, Rory, this has a knock-on effect in your world, doesn't it? Of EVs. Because part of the legislation demands a compulsory carbon footprint declaration and label for electric vehicle batteries. So could this finally help consumers decide whether or not they are being environmentally friendly by trading up to an electric car? Because there's always that equation in your head, isn't there? I think it will always be quite murky uh, about whether an electric car um, truly is environmentally friendly because the, the supply chain is so enormous. It's not just the company and um, that's responsible for building the car, but they outsource a lot of the parts. So the batteries, for example, might come from uh, a different supplier and the electronics might come from someone else. And then the deeper you go down that rabbit hole is the more likely you are to find out how green or not green those parts might happen to be. But I think the more clarity we have on the situation, the better uh, that the industry will become. At the moment, Battery recycling in cars especially is tremendously difficult because they tend to weld the batteries together very tightly and extracting all the components that we need from the battery is not only difficult, but also quite dangerous at times because of the the volatile nature of the components inside the batteries. Um, So yeah, we're getting there slowly, but we have to get there even quicker, particularly with so many people beginning to use lithium ion batteries, especially with the Um, onset of electric cars becoming the only choice that we'll have on the new car market come 2030. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, you're up next after this. Okay, Rebecca, your turn. Uh, What do you think this week will be remembered for? Is this the week our understanding of life changes forever? It's designed not to be a Frankenstein type of science, but certainly we need to to be concerned that we're not going to be implanting these embryos in wombs. We're not going to be producing living human beings from nothing, as it were, but the regulators have to keep pace. Dr. Hilary Jones, GP, speaking on ITV's Good Morning Britain last week. Uh, Rebecca, what's happened this week? Well, this is a really interesting study that's just come out. Uh, UK and US scientists have been able to create synthetic human embryos. That's sidestepping the need for eggs and sperm by using what's known as embryonic stem cells. Now, while these embryos don't have a heartbeat or even the beginnings of a brain, the research is raising really important questions about the concept of life itself, even though it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. Okay. So what are some of those questions? I guess, are they alive? I mean, the questions are really interesting. And I think it's it's an ethical and legal quandary that, that, that we're facing at the moment, uh, particularly as the research is progressing faster than we can answer those ethical and legal dilemmas, such as, is this a life? I mean, technically under the law, um, an embryo is created by the fertilization of a permitted egg and a permitted sperm whatever um, the law takes that to mean. And I just think that we're looking at a very difficult question surrounding how we define life and, and what what we take life to mean. I mean. So Chandrika, do you understand what it even is that we're talking about? Because I'm not sure I do. Synthetic human embryos. I mean, what literally, what is that? What does it look like? Yeah, I find it really tricky because the language hasn't really evolved far enough to kind of describe it. So it's still called embryo models, but some of the articles I've been reading say, but it's definitely not an embryo. And I'm like, but it's called an embryo model. Um, 
So some researchers are saying a revised definition is absolutely needed because what is going on here? There is something around a 14-day rule that seems very important that um, they can't be allowed to develop beyond 14 days, although researchers are trying to push that to 21 because that leaves a kind of empty area where no research is undertaken and that we don't know what actually happens to human embryos at that period of time. Um, but I will say it's it's kind of quite dense and foggy, the language, and I don't feel I entirely know what's going on. And I do kind of slightly wonder if there's a bit of a race to try and be the first team to, to solve this problem, if that's actually the real story. Yeah, you're, you're nodding there, Rebecca. There was a piece, wasn't there, in The Telegraph, talking about this research as, quote, a biological gold rush. Talk me through that. So it's a highly competitive race, as, as you correctly mentioned. And I think that piece in the Telegraph really underscores the the kind of debate between two teams, um, one in Israel and the UK and US scientists who have developed this research, who are both kind of battling it out to be the first to make these scientific developments. Now, that team in Israel was headed by Dr. Jacob Hanna, and he suggested that this latest research has no data, no backup, and no responsibility. And some experts are saying it's irresponsible for Professor Magdalena zernika Goetz, who led this study, to be talking about her research in this way. Because it's not necessarily been published in a traditional sense. It was announced in The Guardian, wasn't it? Not in a scientific paper. Well, exactly. Research like this usually presents data alongside it, and it hasn't been peer-reviewed or published in full. So there's some questions there that remain to be answered. Okay, so those are the questions for scientists, Rory. I mean, what were your questions looking at this story? My first question was, could these things become real babies? Like, that's that's what we all want to know, right? And they <laughs> right. actually just grow a baby out of whatever, like thin air. Um, and it looks like, from the you know very basic research that I've done on this, the answer in short, is not yet. So apparently one of the scientists from the Clem Jones Center for Regenerative Medicine at Bond University said that this can't happen quite yet because in humans, a fertilized egg will go down the fallopian tube and then rapidly divide to form a cluster of cells. And I think that's where these uh, embryonic models are at the moment. But at the point where these cells enter the womb and become blastocysts and then, you know, further on becoming fetuses. I don't think we're at that stage yet where that's even possible or if they've even bothered experimenting uh, with with that stage. So for anyone out there who's terrified that they're going to be growing children that, you know, may or may not be humans because they didn't come from humans, um, I don't think we're quite at that stage yet. But one day, maybe they will. Is this the end of sex, Sir Chandrika? I don't know if I'm the right person to make that announcement. Um, probably not, because it's not the only reason that people have sex. So, um, yeah, I guess that we've got to look forward to the day when they can create these models that can develop into babies with the placenta and the yolk sac. And then they're going to have to name them something else because they have the potential to become people. Um, so the definitions and the idea of where life begins is shifting the whole time. And I don't think for like a lay person, I can really understand it any better from reading about it. Well, what is the goal, do you think, Rebecca? Is it that you, like I say, sort of have sex for pleasure, uh, but reproduction will happen in a lab? Or is it something else? What are they actually aiming towards? The real aim of this scientific research is to make developments in terms of how we view health conditions. Whilst it's interesting to to look at, you know, those ethical and legal dilemmas, I think there's a real scientific idea of progress happening here. I mean, synthetic embryos are good because theoretically they can be made in unlimited numbers, unlike spare IVF embryos, which are in short supply. So now we can look at ideas of regenerative medicine. This could help with genetic disorders, understanding type 1 diabetes, and even the advancement of IVF. And also, uh, the scientists that published in The Guardian, Rory, were saying could help us understand what happens to fetuses when things go wrong. Miscarriage, for example. Yeah, so they offer enormous potential to kind of unlock the secrets of early pregnancy and give a bit of an insight into what leads to miscarriages or other birth defects. The technology allows these cells to grow beyond the kind of 14-day limit placed on human embryo experimentation, but 
and a lot of this kind of difficulties emerge after 14 days. So miscarriages happen, you know, way after that. So what's going to happen then? Like, you know, if, if, a, if an embryo model has the significant possibility of ultimately leading to the birth of a baby, should it be treated ethically and legally like a human embryo? And at that point, do you then insert it into a human womb? And all of that raises really significant ethical dilemmas. It's very, very difficult. Yeah, except Chandrika, I mean, we mentioned IVF briefly, you know, a few years ago only, people were arguing that that was unethical. Uh, it's now become a thing that people accept is part of modern medicine. I mean, is that what's going to happen here? So at the moment, legally, you can't implant these um, entities into a woman. It is illegal and they wouldn't develop into a, a baby anyway. But I think these... These lines are drawn in the sand, but they're not carved in stone and they can be argued and moved around a lot, often to the detriment of women's rights. I mean, recently we've just had a woman been given jail time um, for getting an abortion during lockdown. And in America, Roe v. Wade is not what it was when it came in in the 70s. It's not safe. So I think all of these arguments around what is a kind of slightly philosophical debate, a scientific debate. It's it's about belief and where that intersects with the rights of the human being who would incubate the embryo. Um, I think these will continue to be discussed. Yeah, I mean, you say women's rights, Chandrika. I mean, it also <laughs> arguably has an impact on men's rights too, doesn't it? If sperm is not required to create life. Yeah, of course. And again, really complex issues coming in there. So you have on the one hand... Um, the person who would incubate the embryo. On the other hand, someone whose genetic material might be used or might not be used and that might not figure into their rights and what they wanted. It is really, really complex. But on the other hand, it could bring so much hope to people because infertility, particularly male infertility, has been rising and this could be possibly in the future something that allows people to live full lives and then do their family planning when they're ready to. So, I mean, it's just such a gigantic area. There's loads of pros, loads of cons, and emotion and human frailty will get tangled up in it inevitably. And just briefly, Rebecca, in terms of the regulation, what do you think is coming around the corner? Because we talked briefly about this 14-day limit. Why is that there and could it be gone? Well, the legal limit of 14 days is to prevent the embryo developing past a certain um gastrulation points that's a milestone and to put that in perspective that's when the the embryo or the baby is is smaller than a poppy seed um so while there's primordial cells there past that 14 day black box period there's no development now in terms of what's coming around the corner it's difficult to say i think there's still the ethical dilemmas there that we need to wrestle with and it just brings to mind the idea of science fiction, really. There's always backlash against people who tamper with Mother Nature when it comes to science fiction. And, you know, you only have to look at things like Brave New World to to see where this could potentially go in the future. I think it will be a matter for politicians and scientists to continue to uh, argue about. Okay. So, Jandrika, you're up next after this. <laughs> Okay, so Chandrika, you're finishing the show. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Good news. If you snooze, you don't necessarily lose. We're in the middle of a sleep deprivation epidemic. In fact, scientists from Oxford University say we're sleeping about one to two hours less per night than we were 60 years ago. I find that absolutely incredible, especially when you consider that sleep deprivation is associated with all kinds of negative health consequences, such as putting on weight or an increased risk of diabetes. Ah, Dr. Chatterjee, isn't he lovely? Four tips to help you sleep, a video from his YouTube channel back in 2018. Uh, so Chandrika, we all know sleep is important. Um, so what's what's new? So um, in the journal Sleep Health, researchers at UCL this week and from the University of the Republic of Paraguay have reported the results of the study, which says that taking naps of a certain amount of time, not like for the whole afternoon, um, they can help our brain increase in volume. Now, a brain that's larger in volume tends to be healthier, um, more intelligent, and isn't aging 
at the same rate. So this is from um, the science journal Nature. And um, they sort of summed up the study by saying the information gathered from all almost 400,000 people in Britain aged between 40 and 69. It showed that those with a genetic disposition for napping had a larger total brain volume. So your brain actually gets bigger if you take a nap? I wonder if it's as straightforward as that. Because <laughs> <laughs> firstly, that term, a genetic disposition for napping, I mean, number one, would have loved to have had that excuse at school. But I mean, that is that is a real like scientific term that's really important. And it means not all of us will get these benefits and not all of us need to nap or want to nap and so therefore even if we were disposed to getting these benefits we'll never find out because we're not doing the napping um but i suppose the most important thing is that it's guarding against brain shrinkage that is something that happens with age it's something that's linked to lots of brain disorders and sort of uh, degenerative brain disorders near the end of life so it could be something that helps protect us as we age and yet rory there is still a stigma isn't there about napping during the day i suppose maybe less so now more people work from home and i know that in you know some of the silicon valley companies they've got their sleep pods in their workspaces but generally speaking if you're in an office and you say i need half an hour to go and sleep your colleagues might take a dim view Usually because it's after a hangover. <laughs> but yeah, I, I get your point. Um, you know, some I hear a lot of celebrities saying that um, they don't sleep a lot. Elon Musk famously said that he only sleeps six hours a night. There's a lot of like self-help gurus who kind of advocate sleeping less and being more productive. But, you know, I don't think we needed a study to tell us that having a nap makes you, you know, not necessarily smarter, but just able to absorb more information. If I'm tired and cranky, and and just like not in a great mood because I'm knackered, I'm much less likely to be able to do complex tasks and, and want to do complex tasks, quite frankly. And a little nap, you know, never hurt anyone at all. And it's, by the way, the, um, the number you're looking for is 15.8 cubic centimeters in increased total brain volume. So now we have an official number to tell people that if you have a nap, 15.8 centimetres of extra brain power. That's what you get. Well, it does make you think, Rebecca, doesn't it? Like, we, you know, the world around us has been constructed because of our physical limitations. I mean, the fact that there is a working day at all is because humans do need to sleep, whether Elon Musk says so or not. Do we need to reconfigure our lives to allow for napping more? Well, I think that's an interesting question because I've been reading a bit about circadian rhythms. Uh, that determines the ideal time of correctly structured sleep. Now, this sleep professor has said the pressure to sleep builds on awakening the first time we open our eyes in the morning. But the signal for wakefulness, the, the time that we are awake, doesn't kick in until the late afternoon. So in between is the perfect time for a nap, really. But that just happens to be when most of us are headlong into a working day, busy, busy, busy. But perhaps there could be benefits to a 30 minute power nap, so to speak, in that window of time. I mean, everyone's different, obviously, Sir Chandrika. I don't know where you stand on this. I actually find it difficult to nap. I, I like the idea. I like the idea of taking half an hour out, and I sometimes do that, go for a walk or something, or have a long lunch. But the idea of actually going to sleep, my body doesn't want to do that. Yeah, I'm kind of the same. So I've been freelance for five years, and you think I could have been sleeping all through those afternoons and having a great time. Um, but I, I'm not really that person. Um, particularly in summer, I find I'm awake really early, and then the, the lightness just won't let me get there. But I will say that... Um, it's really important how long these naps are. So there is a downside here and there's something you need to really worry about. And that is that long naps are associated with a higher risk of obesity, according to a Spanish study that's been going on at the same time as this British study that's um, been written about in the journal Sleep Health. So siestas are, you know, uh, a part of Mediterranean culture. And that was, that's what makes this very interesting that this is a, a Spanish study. Are siestas a secret weapon for better health? Are they part of that Mediterranean diet that we're told is meant to like uh, make us live longer and have healthier lives? Um, so this was from a scientific journal called Obesity. And a team of Spanish scientists looked into the napping question and they conducted the study of um, 3,000 Spaniards from Mercia. And they found that if people slept for longer than 30 minutes in these naps, that a 2% higher body mass index uh, than the non-sleepers. And then they also had a 23% higher risk of obesity and a 40% higher risk of metabolic syndrome, which is um, where like your insulin isn't working very well and you kind of have slightly higher blood sugar and it's usually, usually a precursor to diabetes. Um, there's also a higher risk of developing cardiovascular de disease. So it seems that you've got to really set that alarm and stick to it. What I do find is if I ever do nap in the afternoon, 
the moment I wake up, I've got no idea where I am, what time is it and what year is it. But I also want more sleep and that is dangerous. And what about the link with Alzheimer's then, Rory? I mean, if you've got that in your family, your ears are going to prick up at anything, isn't it? Any any research that might help mitigate that if, if you've you know lost a, a parent or a grandparent to Alzheimer's? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so previous research has suggested that naps could be like an early symptom of Alzheimer's disease. But the thing about these studies is that it's very difficult to take any of them seriously. Look at those studies that were done about, I don't know, drinking red wine, for example. They used to say, that a little bit of red wine is good for your heart because of antioxidants and preventing heart disease and and stroke and, and early death. But then you read other studies and they say that you drink red wine, drinking no red wine is better than drinking some red wine. So it's difficult to take any of these studies seriously. I think we should all just nap if you want to nap. I like I like to do that on the, on a Sunday watching the F one. Um, and if you want to stay awake, stay awake. That is such a burn on F1, Rory. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so Chandrika, are you going to be incorporating naps into your daily routine now as a result of this reading? Oh, I, it's the getting up that's so painful. And I'd probably rather go for a walk. To be honest, I feel more energised after that. So mm, I'm not convinced. Yeah, I suppose how you come out of the nap is relevant, isn't it, Rebecca? Like, you know, you need. To, I, I suppose you need to emerge from it properly, you know, and productively. No, exactly. I always feel the same way. I feel super groggy after a, a, an afternoon nap. So I try not to take them. But really, it's just not It's not just about napping, but napping in the right way in the first place. So a lot of these uh, studies and professors suggest that you have to start your nap in the right way. So for example, uh, Russell Foster from the University of Oxford said, no more than 20 minutes, no later than 2pm, and you have to sleep in a certain position also so um i'll be trying to take those tips on board if and when i go for an afternoon nap do you have any tips actually in general terms chandrika for going to sleep for people who want to take a nap now perhaps uh, having got to the end of this podcast i mean i'm sure people are very energized by this podcast but just in case um i find a good way to fall asleep in general and i wonder if for a 20 minute nap which means you're not getting like rem deep sleep are you it's kind of surface level yeah. i find a podcast episode that I've listened to before and maybe more of a com <laughs> like so not first time, not first time because I want to listen to it and I want to yeah, it was going stimulating on. too many neurons. Yeah, yeah, one that I've listened to before and one that's maybe more conversational than the one that's like discussing issues. That can help me maybe gently fall asleep to it. But you know, as Rebecca mentioned, like it's the waking up. Like I, I don't know if I'm necessarily cognitively more switched on afterwards. I mean that's still part of the working day that's that's there. So Rory, do you have a, a tip of going to sleep? Um, yeah, drink very heavily the night before. So it needs some forward planning. And have some young children as well. That helps too, doesn't it, I find? Yeah. <laughs> have to ruin enough in one step. Uh, Rebecca? Well, my dad used to read me uh, the complete works of Shakespeare sometimes to uh, make me fall asleep what? as a child. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, presumably selected highlights from, I mean, <laughs> yeah. reading the complete works, that's an 18-hour job. Yeah, some of the speeches, I think, just, just puts you into that kind of lulled mood. But um, no, I think, you know, a nice Caribbean wave in the background tends to uh, kind of help me drift off gently to sleep. So I would definitely recommend that. Yeah, I think we could all do with that. And I'm going to have to just search for that sound on my white noise app. Uh, but it's a close second. Uh, my thanks to Rebecca, Sachandrika, and Rory. If you're still awake, then remember to follow this show for free and get every episode as soon as it's released by searching for The Week Unwrapped wherever you get your podcasts and tapping follow. And if you want to re-listen to an episode you've already heard before to help you go to sleep, I'm up for that. Uh, you can also get six free issues of The Week magazine with a trial subscription when you go to theweek.co.uk slash subscribe. In the meantime, I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sophie King at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye.